So, Jeremy, um, welcome, welcome to this um, fire ekferret fire chat talk uh, around your uh, recently, very recently published uh, book, uh, The Web of Meaning, and and this is what it it looks like. So, welcome, Jeremy. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. It's just a great pleasure to to be with you today. So, thanks for for those of our. Um, uh, listeners and, and viewers who are not familiar with uh, yourself and with your work, uh, could you just please introduce yourself and the work you've been doing the, uh, the last years, uh, just in a few sentences, please? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I, I call myself an author and integrator, uh, which is a little bit unusual because I see a lot of my work as actually integrating the different parts of the way we make meaning that generally our society tells us to keep separate. Um, and the work I do really looks a lot at basically the underlying meaning making that has the different cultures have had over history that brought us to this present day and recognizes that it's the way we make meaning that will really uh, change our future. So this most recent book, The Web of Meaning is actually about a way of making sense of the world, a worldview that is very different from the mainstream worldview we have right now. And that could redirect the course of civilization to something much more flourishing. Mm -hmm. and, and before this book, you, you wrote the very much praised book, uh, the, the patterning uh, instinct that in, in many ways has changed my way of, of viewing things. I actually did not read this before I wrote my book, The, uh, the World We Create, but right. I can see a lot of parallels in your thinking there and my writing in, in The World We Create. And I think this book, The Patterning Instinct, is very important to uh, understand because I see your new book as more or less a continuation of the project that you started in the patterning instinct. So if you could please mention a few words about the patterning instinct as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely, Thomas. And in fact, um, you're quite right about the continuation. I, I really view this new book, The Web of Meaning, as a sequel in, yeah. a, in a way to the patterning instinct. And actually, when I initially formed these ideas of what I was going to write some a, a while ago, more than 10 years ago now, I initially conceived this would be one book that where basically the first part of it looks at the almost like um, a diagnosis of what's wrong and the second part being like a little bit like a prescription, if you will, of here's where we can actually fix what's wrong. But it was way too big to fit into one book. So it's now two. But um, so the two pattern. Fairly, fairly big book. <laughs> right. It's not even like they're such small books, either no, of them. No. Um, but the, the patterning instinct looks at the different ways in which cultures have made meaning out of the universe all the way back from the earliest times of human cognition, like the early hunter-gatherers, nomadic hunter-gatherers. Um, and it looks at the ways in which different changes in history led to new ways of meaning making. When agriculture began or um, shifts in East Asian versus European ways of meaning making and how those ways in which cultures made meaning out of the world actually shaped history. And so the big essential message really to come out of this first book, The Patterning Instinct, um, is as I, I sort of distill it, the culture shapes values and those values are what shape history. And of course, by the same token, it's our values today that will actually shape the direction of the future. And, and, and our worldview. Uh, today. Right. So, so another way of saying exactly the same thing is that uh, that the direction of history is actually determined by our worldview. Yes. And perhaps even exactly. underneath the, the worldview, even more subconscious aspects like you're talking about uh, root metaphors and, right. uh, and the very basic, basic structures of our uh, symbolic world, which I, in my book, and like some sociologists call our collective imaginary, the, right. the, the, the most unconscious part of our culture. That is right, Thomas. And in fact, it's the 
it's because worldviews are mostly implicit and unconscious that they are so incredibly powerful. It's a little bit like a fish swimming in water. And, you know, you might look at it and see that the fish is in water, but if you, the fish doesn't realize it's in water, it's, that's just its mode of existence. Mm. And a worldview is like that. Like we, it's not like somebody teaches us at age 10, they sit you down and say, okay, now here's our worldview. This is what we all believe and you meant to accept. It's just implicit in all the statements, the metaphors that we use in our sentences, the ways in which the, people- The language even. The language. The, language, even, language the, the, even. the words we are using, but also how we structure sentences. Exactly. It's sort so, of in, implying uh, something. And I think you take that example uh, in- the pattern instinct that we in the Western world have languages that are very much centered on the uh, nouns, on, on things, That's whereas right. many of the Eastern languages are centered on the verbs. That exactly makes it much right. more process uh, yes. oriented rather than fixed things oriented. Exactly. So, and, and that's completely right. The <clears throat> language itself plays a huge part and the structure of the language um, and everything else about our culture, just um, the ways in which people relate to each other, the behaviors, the, um, all the things that we take for granted. And that's where, in order to recognize uh, that we do have a worldview, we need to actually, it, it helps to look at the fact that other worldviews exist and then begin to recognize the differences between them mm. and see that things we just take for granted. And this is not just in sort of a mainstream, uh, sort of unthinking uh, type stuff, but even like scientists who uh, has, believe so strongly in what they're doing as if it's objectively true, oftentimes fail to realize that they're looking at things through a particular lens Mm. Um, and that lens actually affects and distorts to some degree um, what they're seeing. Mm, yeah. So, uh, so I sometimes say that, as, as I believe, and I, and I think you agree with me, that we are living in, in quite exceptional times right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a time of a, a shift of worldview. You might call it a paradigm shift. It's a shift in civilization. So we have had a dominant worldview and a civilization that has helped us during the last couple of hundred years to, to really uh, achieve a lot of things that we would never want to be without, like, like yes. modern science, medicine, uh, human rights and democracy and, and, and other things. But somehow it feels like that worldview is starting to uh, become exhausted and we are running up to, the, to its limitations and that we are probably going into a term or a time of turbulence where right. we are in this shift and i think that it is in those times of of deep turbulence deep societal shifts where we need to do exactly what you are doing in your two two books and that is to look deep into both history like you are doing um, you, you are looking at the history and the different worldviews that we have applied during history. And we can see today how there is a rising interest in deep history, the Yuval right. Harari sort of history mm -hmm. over thousands and tens of thousands of right. years. But also we need to go deep in understanding ourselves, looking into deep psychology. That's why Jungian yes. psychology and, and speaking about just as you do root metaphors and and archetypes and these things but then yes. also finally in sociology going deep into deep sociology and looking at these layers of society that we right. in normal times can take for granted that that are now in flux and up for grabs and we need to understand what's going on on these deep deep layers and that is why I, where i find your work uh, fascinating mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. And in fact, yeah, in, in the patterning instinct in particular, I talk about it as a, um, I call it a cognitive history, because it's a history not just of sort of kings and queens and con conquerors, oh. but it's a history of how thought shifted at those deeper layers, mm. which is why it's called the patterning instinct to begin with, because it's really cognitive science that shows that we humans, actually part of our defining characteristics is that we have this instinct to pattern meaning into the universe. And that's the very instinct that caused us to learn language, to develop culture. Um, and 
And so it's the patterning instinct that drives exactly this kind of behavior. So we can see the history of this, almost like an archaeology of the mind, as if we're archaeologists in some uh, place digging deep into the uh, different layers, just as you're describing. But actually, we're deeping, we're digging deep into the mind, in each of our minds, because mm. we inherit mm. these sometimes archetypal ways of meaning making. But, all, fact, but also, yeah. I, I would I would stress that you are doing in, in our collective mind. Absolutely. Because I, I love the distinction and, and the, the fine that, that you really bring, bring out an understanding that, yes, these are deep psychological processes that are taking place in our individual minds, but then there is also a collective aspect of our, of our consciousness and our ability to take these individual ideas and then put them out into society into culture and there they take on a life of their own and That's then right. affect us as individuals both in our generation and in, in coming generations so so yes. there is something out there in the collective that we, we need to be aware of and that we might need once we become aware of it to take a little bit more responsibility for mm -hmm. than we have done previously throughout history, or, or what would you say? Yes. I think that's completely right uh, there, Thomas. And in, in this new book, The Web of Meaning, I call um, these, these uh, ways of looking at our consciousness, both individual and collective, as um, attractors of consciousness. And an attractor is basically is a concept that comes from systems thinking, looking at complex systems and looks at the different resilient patterns in which every complex self-organized system tends to stay in, always changing, but always, um, at least for long times, staying within relatively predictable boundaries and then occasionally shifting in what's known as a phase transition. Mm -hmm. And within human consciousness, and and, and and of course, sorry, yeah. of of course, to tie this to what we just said, right now, right, I believe that society, which can be viewed as such a a complex adaptive system, right. is in one of these phase tra right. transitions. So we are in a phase transition. That is why we see the turbulence. That's right. And out of exactly. such a phase transition, we could see a positive emergence, but mm -hmm. we could also see a breakdown. Yes, that's that is completely right, and uh, and that is the point that actually worldviews, which we can think of as kind of uh, what I call attract uh, cultural attractors, uh, attractors that can remain over long periods of time, they can be very stable. If you look at like tra the traditional Chinese worldview, that was stable for millennia, or mm -hmm. look at Christianity as a worldview that was stable for well over a millennium uh, in terms of dominant dominating people's ways of thinking. But so then the question is, what changes these attractors of uh, these cultural attractors? What causes these phase transitions? Sometimes it's when changes happen endogenously within the system, which is really a lot like what happened when the scientific revolution occurred in the 17th century. Enough uh, new ways of thinking came together to really subvert the old way of thinking from within. And there's also the exogenous factors. Like if you look at what caused the traditional Chinese worldview to change. It was the humiliation that came from generations of Western powers coming in, dominating, basically undermining society where new generations rejected their parents' ideas and said, we've got to find uh, ideas from this more powerful culture that's now mm. dominating. Mm. So now we look at our, our current century. And the one thing I think we can be sure about in terms of this century is that this is going to cause a major phase transition in the whole human experience, every bit as big as the scientific revolution, probably bigger, maybe even as big as the transition from nomadic hunter-gatherers to agriculture 10,000 years ago. Because some, some, is, some historians call uh, the axial age shift. Right. Well, yeah. the axial age shift actually was more like around 2,500 years ago when after the agrarian civilizations had become very established around the world, there was this shift in consciousness, which you see um, everywhere from the Buddha in East Asia to Confucius or like um, Plato 
so for the Old Testament prophets in, um, in Israel. And you see the shift in consciousness to looking for a more transcendent way of making sense of things rather than the more parochial way. Mm, and mm. similar, this now in this century, we can expect these changes because the ways in which our, the human, the power of technology is shifting things dramatically. Also, the human impact on the world is causing our whole civilization to basically unravel. Mm. Uh, the, the relationship of, between humans and the natural world has gone to this point of moving towards cataclysm. And the real big question is not whether there'll be this massive shift, but just like you were pointing to before, what will it look like? Mm. Will it be collapse? Will it be a bifurcation in the human species itself between the elites and the rest of, of uh, humanity that is just suffering the dire devastation of, cult of climate breakdown? Or is it possible to actually transform to a worldview of our connectedness and actually redirect humanity to a different path? But to do that would be to really change the, some of the fundamentals of our way of living right now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that entails a change in, in worldview. So, so yes. that is where we, where we need to start. So if, if we just to make this a little bit more concrete and e easy to understand. So if we look at the Western civilization, which is most familiar to, 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 to me, um, the big changes in worldview that we have had, could, could we say that we, we had the pre-modern worldview, uh, which you might call a religious worldview, it might have been a Christian uh, right. worldview that was dominating uh, the West for, as you said, a, a thousand, well over a thousand years. Yes. And then we had this transition from the pre-modern to the modern worldview mm -hmm. during, the, during the Enlightenment and the right. scientific uh, revolution. So then we've been in this pr uh, modern worldview for a long time. And that modern worldview is dominated by reason and, and science. Uh, analytic thinking, logics, um, and perhaps we, we put a little bit too much faith in reason and science, and then we got the postmodern critique of, of modernity and the modern worldview, which is very relevant and pointing out a lot of limitations in, in the modern worldview. But it's mainly a critique. It's, it's not strong enough to build a new worldview. And some thinkers in our networks are toying with the idea that we are going now from a modern worldview via the postmodern critique of that worldview to a metamodern worldview, right. which, which would be the worldview that we would need in order to, to uh, increase the odds for a positive emergence at this bifurcation point. Right. Right. So if, if we would then look at that worldview, do we, could we say anything about that worldview or will that also be emergent or, or can we have some ideas at least of what that worldview might look yes. like? And I guess that that is a bit your project in, that is. in your that, latest that, book. That, that is basically the, this new book, The Web of Meaning is designed to actually offer a solid rigorous foundation for that alternative worldview. Mm. And I think the, um, to get a little bit more specific about what that means, you know, as you were describing the modern worldview that arose from the 17th century, um, quite rightly focusing on the way it often characterizes itself as being all about reason and the intellect and scientific thought. Um, but in addition to that, Actually, and, and even where the underlying um, the underlying basis of this kind of focus on reason came from is it's a worldview of separation, and I think that's what I, I show in the book where um, for all of the different sort of ontological perspectives or these big existential questions of who am I, where am I, what am I, how should I live, these kind of questions. I show how the modern worldview gives answers based on a sense of separation. So in terms of the fundamentals, what the modern worldview ever since the 17th century has said is humans are separate from nature. 
that it, we're separate from ourselves. We have a separate mind, like that place of reason mm -hmm. from the body. Um, and that actually like that Cartesian concept is I think, therefore I am. My true identity is in that kind of reasoning. And therefore um, animals and even our own bodies don't really, aren't, aren't sort of real the way that our, our mind is. And in fact, even use it as a machine. And once we begin to see nature as a machine, you get this um, notion of exploitation and extraction as being fundamental to our value system. That as humans, we're, um, we're supreme, we're superior to anything else around us. All of nature is there for us to exploit and extract. Mm. And the Europeans, of course, took this um, to a uh, seeing themselves as white, uh, um, you know, white European Christians as being there to basically dominate and conquer the rest of the world. Mm. So it's no, no surprise, really, when you look back on it. It's not a coincidence that in that same time, within just a few decades in Europe around that time, we see the rise not just of scientific thinking, but also the rise of colonialism, um, the rise of capitalism, and the rise of white supremacy in this kind of... Um, uh, way of understanding other humans from this point of view of racist hierarchy. Mm. And I mean, so it's an instrumental view. That same yeah. place. Mm. And it's all based on this sense of separateness. Mm. So in the web of meaning, in this new book, I show how actually we it's possible to, in fact, um, explore a worldview of connectedness. It's mm. not just that it's possible, but actually what modern science shows um, is very different from those the science sciences it was three four hundred years ago as Descartes or um, Bacon or Hobbes were developing it. It shows actually that we are deeply connected. That yes. actually the relationship between things are more important often than the things themselves. And and, it shows, and, and, and I totally agree yeah. with with that worldview. Being a physicist by by right. by training, I mean that 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 is absolutely. Uh, clear and you don't need to go to physics you can just go to neurobiology and see how we are interconnected with mirror neurons and and all of those things so we are right. these very interconnected but before we go there i just want to stay a little bit on on this development of the individual right at, at, at the enlightenment because of course it had all of these negative effects that that you just mentioned but i would also argue that that was a huge step forward for humanity because before them we were just part of a collective and we did not have any individual rights and we were just in in an interconnected chain of being where we had to accept whatever the lord of the land who was appointed by god was telling us and we we had no rights as an individual with this in invention of the individual came things like human rights and democracy and the possibility even to think about uh, and talk about self-actualization and what I want to do with my life. That was not a question for a peasant um, 500 years ago. So when we are now talk, speaking about that we need to realize that we are all interconnected, how can we take that step while still honoring all the good things that came out of the individualization project and that we are not stepping back to a medieval worldview where we are all just part of a collective. Yes, I, you're completely right about that. The only thing I'd point out is that that medieval worldview itself, we we were really part of a hierarchical collective. It wasn't that it was a collective in the sense of people sharing their rights and responsibilities no, together. No, no. It was just basically being um, owned essentially by yeah, the, yeah. the power elites. And yeah. if we look back to how humans spent most of our history as nomadic hunter gatherers, there, there was a sense that group identity um, didn't didn't take away people's individuality, but it was it was actually it's a natural human instinct to to actually fulfill your own sense of identity as part of being a group. That um, some of these natural instincts in humans basically then got lost with the rise of agriculture, 
and in these incredibly hierarchical civilizations that to your point, the scientific revolution and those breakthroughs in Europe um, were a fantastic step um, forward to relinquish some of these hierarchical and um, uh, very much, uh, it, it was, wasn't so much about group identity, but it was about figuring out where you fit in order to serve hmm. this greater yeah. elite pyramid or whatever. Yeah. So, but, but I think I don't, I don't want to go back to some sort of, of uh, naive idealization right. of, uh, of indigenous uh, culture either. Of course, right. we, we, we lost a lot of good things when we went from, from the hunter-gatherer society in, into the more hierarchical me medieval or pre-modern societies. But uh, in a, a tribal society, you had as an individual zero possibility to step outside of the culture. That's right. You had absolutely exactly. no way of stepping out of the of culture. And today we, we, we have. That's so, right. so still we, we as individuals have gained freedom through absolutely. modernity, I, I, I would argue. So my point yes. is just to, to make sure that we understand that what we are talking about now is the connecting interconnectedness and the interrelatedness and the interdependency that we all have that is beyond that's the, right beyond our individualization we are not exactly. giving up the individualization yes. but we are finding this beyond so it's a I, step beyond yeah i agree completely with with what you're saying thomas and just to um, be really clear about it in this book the web of meaning i never suggest going back to some golden age, which just exists in people's imaginations, is never there. Um, but the, the real invitation in the book is to look at what modern science tells us, to, to look at how um, earlier traditions, whether it's Buddhism, Taoism, or indigenous knowledge, um, had deep understanding of some of these elements of connectedness that we can now actually treasure and and regain that understanding as part of a way of looking at how we relate going forward into the future, not mm -hmm. trying to go back. And to your point, Thomas, um, I think the key is something I explore in some detail in the book is this notion of integration, uh, which we can define quite simply as being um, this um, unity with differentiation. So the whole notion of integration, and we see this concept of integration is fundamental to life, all living systems, whether it's a single cell, an ecosystem, any, any living system. We see it in how consciousness arises from our neurons relating. In all cases, you have different groups or different areas that are distinct, but they're also related in a way so that the system as a whole is cohesive and connected, but every individual part of the system is what makes the system and it makes the system healthy by doing what it does at its best. Mm -hmm. So a path of integration recognizes the diversity of people, recognizes that each of us um, can fulfill our, our true individual purpose in life, what Aristotle termed as eudaimonia. Um, and by doing that, by doing that in a healthy relationship with the systems of which we're embedded fractally, we actually can be contributing to making the whole system healthier. And it works the other way too, that the, we can only really fulfill ourselves when the system in which we're embedded is a healthy system, allowing that to happen. So it's a lot about the reciprocal, what's known as reciprocal causality between the system and the whole and its ind individual part. I think that's uh, where a, a lot of this new book looks at. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, how we move not into the past, but we move beyond yeah. this exclusive focus on individuality. Yeah, we, we, we need uh, um, a worldview and a culture that can help us in, integrate these uh, indivi indiv individuals, individuated right. individuals. Right. So, so, so in previous times, it was very difficult for an individual to grow beyond the culture. Uh, in, in modernity, has made it possible for us to individuate and to find our purpose in life. But we have done that to a large extent at the expense of the collective. So now the question is, can, can we form a worldview and can we form a culture that lets us keep 
the possibility to develop and flourish as individuals and at mm -hmm. the same time look at the collective and have a flourishing collective at the same time and the going back and forth fractally as you said to to have a society that lets us flourish as individuals and thereby mm -hmm. the society can flourish yes and i think um really i think one of the um explorations i look at in the book is that true individual flourishing cannot actually happen as long as we define ourselves strictly as separate individuals separate from all that's around us i think one of the ways in which we've seen things unfold over the last century is this focus on individuality rather than leading to millions upon millions of people out there in the world feeling the sense of true self-actualization what they basically end up with is a sense of alienation and 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 by not having uh, really by not feeling connected with anything larger around them and um, this emptiness gets filled by consumerism mm -hmm. so people by losing a sense of meaning as something that they're uh, something bigger they're connected with they fill that up uh, with these messages that say have more status you know like try to be viewed uh, um, in a higher way than others spend more money look for and um, something that will make you feel better for the next hour or day or year or whatever, and then do the next thing, like a hedonic treadmill. And part of what I explore in the book is how actually meaning itself and our sense of purpose is a function of connectedness. It's only once we realize our too deep connection, um, first of all, within ourselves, between our own mind and body, with um, the life force within us, connection with other humans around us in community and with all of life on earth, that is what I describe as the web of meaning. And it's, th it's really through that connectedness, recognizing our true uniqueness, but as part of something so much bigger, that that's where a sense of meaning actually can arise. Mm -hmm. So this um, shift in, in worldview, this mind shift that we could talk about that we, we need uh, in order to move forward, if we should try to see what what components that might contain and again we we know that this is probably going to be an um, it is going to be an emergent process and it's it's difficult or even impossible to say exactly where we will be in even 20 years but still i think that if i read your book correctly you you say that yes we need to shift from viewing ourselves as these isolated individuals maximizing our own individual utility or trying to maximize our own happiness to see that we are much more interconnected than we than we realize and that my own private individual happiness is connected with with the happiness not not just of all other people but the flourishing of the whole ecosystem mm -hmm. so it's going from an individualistic view to a realization of, of connectedness yeah but then the next the next sh shift and correct me if i'm if i'm wrong but it's something like like understanding that going in this shift from viewing things as divisible uh, particles and things to see the, the world much more in terms of processes that That's everything right. is is changing and these interconnected processes so the world is not full of different individuals and things it's much more ongoing interconnected processes yes and um, and that that is a big part of the book is recognizing if we ask questions like what am i well we tend to think ourselves as this fixed entity separate from the rest of the world and um if you know and of course to some degree there's an element of truth in that but more important is the fact that actually even i and you and each of us are ongoing processes mm -hmm. and what one simple way of thinking about this is just to think of uh, a photograph of yourself when you were a child and you know um, that is you in that uh, in that photograph you can even have the memories of it 
but it turns out that every molecule in that little child is different from you now. Most of your cells, and even the cells that stay in the body the, your whole life, are always changing their components. So it's the relationship between all of those cells and molecules that actually remains stable and meaningful rather than the things themselves. Mm. So all of us are processes, and we can begin to then understand everything like mind, consciousness, culture, meaning itself as being uh, based on relationships. And once you look at the implications of that, you realize that actually it invites us to expand our sense of identity out so we can actually begin to identify ourselves with those relationships, um, with those relationships that form us within ourselves, with others, etc. And what I show is that actually our values themselves, the things we feel are, are meaningful, that we want to do with our lives, are very much a function of our identity. If you see mm. yourself as an individual above all, you'll want to maximize your own welfare. If you see yourself as part of a nation above all, you'll be willing to martyr yourself if necessary to defend your nation. If you see yourself as part of life and all of the living earth, well, you'll begin to devote your time to actually trying to prevent some of the destruction our civilization is doing against life. So in each case, the way in how our identity unfolds actually affects the very things that we feel are important. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's important to see ourselves as an ongoing process, but also, as you said, and I think this is very interesting that you point out that also our mind, our consciousness can be viewed as a, as a process and right. you can view it as a self-organizing system. And That's if you right. view our, your mind as a self-organizing system that constantly take in energy and, and information, then it's not difficult to understand that also our mind comes to this bifurcation points where you can actually have a, a more or less rapid step up in complexity. And then you see the world fr from a more complex uh, perspective and that you can have these sort of shifts in consciousness uh, during, your, uh, during your life. That's right. Um, and in fact, those shifts in consciousness really are like smaller versions um, of the same sort of fractal principles of when we were talking about the change in worldview of a, of a culture. Um, they, they are like these phase transitions. Um, and they do, they can happen. It doesn't, some people might stay in that same level of consciousness their entire life. And some people might try to shift the consciousness, but feel like they don't get there. Other times you can, people can talk about this Kensho moment of like a, sun, a moment of awakening when they weren't even expecting it. Um, and I think that we can understand that by recognizing it, that it is a complex system undergoing a phase transition, which can happen um, in a nonlinear way through a combination of internal shifts and exogenous shifts, which is why it's so important for each of us to do our own work, to recognize how our culture has basically colonized and conditioned our minds. And by undoing some of those through recognition and to be very open to different perspectives that we look at out there in the world and to sort of um, bring those into our own way of conceiving our identity. And I think it's that again, bottom up, top down, like internal and external reciprocal process that can allow that shift in consciousness. Mm -hmm. so, so then I, I might say that then th that would be a, a third major shift in, in worldview. So if the first one is going from uh, individual, uh, individuals to connectedness, to separate from separation to connectedness, the sec second would be going from things to processes, then the mm -hmm. third for me would go from the idea that you mentioned, this guy, our mind as a machine, as a rational right. machine that should just be functioning, that is fully right. developed when we are perhaps 20, to really see our mind as a self-organizing, developing system that can develop throughout life and to take a bit of responsibility also for that process, not, not, not only in ourselves, but in society in general, because yes. that thing I think is key in this transition, because as the world becomes more and more complex, so our understanding of the world needs to be more and more complex, both 
cognitively, but also emotionally. That's right. Yes, exactly. It's not just a matter of like studying the complication, the complicated ways in which the weather systems work for climate breakdown, or whatever. It's about deal, uh, bringing it into our felt, um, our felt embodied way of experiencing life. And part of the integration I talk about is that integration between the mind and the body in that regard. And I do think that there's a very you know, important element in what you're saying about this notion of like our identity itself is something that we don't need to say, and I'm not saying in the book like, oh, it's wrong for us to just be fixed on our um, separate ident identity. And what we should all do is have this sort of global identity of being with all of life. But it's more that recognizing that and all of these layers of identity exist in fractal relationships with each other. It's um, Arthur Kerstler first termed the word holarchy, which as this recognition that all complex systems have smaller complex systems within them and are part of bigger complex systems. And similar, that's how life itself works. That's how ecosystem works. And it's this recognition of seeing ourselves in that regard, that we are part of, you can almost imagine um, layers, like a, a sort of a fractal unfolding of layers of identity within bigger layers, within bigger layers. And the, the real complexity and the challenge, but what allows in my view, the most fulfilling way to live in life is to feel our identity shifting quite fluidly from that the tiniest to the largest and there and back and recognize that each of those layers, those fractal layers of identity are valid, but they're most valid when they're all pursuing health of the smaller systems within and the larger systems without. And to your, and to your point, once we begin to see that fluidity of identity, we recognize that what we're doing is not separate from the rest of life around us, but is actually part of it. That we enact our consciousness and our very actions, our very words, every, every way in which we relate to the world is actually not just separate from that world, but is co-creating with others around us our, our world and the future unfolding of it. Yeah, and, and the fact that we are constantly, either we, we are aware of it or not, co-creating the world, that, that, right. that we create the world, the world we create. In your, <laughs> yes, exactly. The world as we create. You, yeah. As you titled it, the world we create, exactly. And, and realizing that m most of the aspects in our human world are actually human constructs, are part of our collective uh, uh, ima imaginary, such things as nations and marriages and money and markets and and all of that and and language and even our worldview is is, right. is a is a human construct so i would say that the the third shift in in worldview that you are arguing for in 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 your book would be to go from a worldview where we take our social world or our societal culture including language and worldview and all of that just for given, like the water for the fish. We, we, right. It's just what we swim in. To start to realize that, no, this is actually a human creation. Yes. That we are constantly recreating and modifying, whether we are aware of it or not. And if it's true, as you say, which I believe is true, that, for example, our worldview is shaping our future. Right. And, of course, it becomes very important to take a look at what is our worldview, yes. what is our societal culture, what, what, what implications and effects does our language have on our way of understanding uh, the world, what other hidden assumptions do we That's have, right. and start exploring this, but also taking a sort of a co-creative responsibility for that. That's right. Yes, exactly. And that's sort of part of, of waking up really is to then uh, realize that actually we, each of us is responsible. Like that waking up brings wonderful feelings of connectivity um, and something much more expansive along with an awesome responsibility to be, to realize the actual destruction that the world, that our civilization is doing in our names. And those of us who are in a position of privilege get the benefits of the destruction that is, um, once we get to those bigger layers of identity, we actually feel ourselves 
the pain that is being caused. Yeah. And so there is this big sort of existential responsibility that arises with that. Yeah, but also re realizing also in, in the in, in all our even smaller acts that that all our acts are somehow leaving uh, tra trace trails uh, in right. the history. So everything okay. we do is part of this co-creation and even the smallest act can That's have right. important effects in right. a complex self-organizing system, especially when it's far away from equilibrium and in situations like this, even the smallest butterfly could have huge uh, effects Completely. somewhere else in, in the system. So, and that's why I call the book um, like the web of meaning. Because, and you know, the analogy is like, imagine you're walking in a forest and, and you see a spider's web there on, on a tree and just the tiniest little drop of water hitting the web or tiniest touch, and you, you can see that the web undulates because of the way in which it's connected yeah. through the entire web. And so similarly, just as you say, and I actually use the um, metaphor like of ripples, like if you just sort of imagine a pond, a still pond, and you throw in a stone and you see ripples go out from where that stone hit the water. And if, but if you throw in a second stone um, right next to it, you'll see two sets of ripples and you'll see them sort of hit each other. And sometimes they'll maybe cancel each other out. Sometimes they'll work together to create a stronger mm. wave going mm. out. So similarly, all of our actions are like putting out this infinite amount of ripples into existence, yeah. into the fabric of existence. And we, that's where some of those ripples, when they are aligned um, with others, actually can energize those others and create far greater uh, transitions than we might even dream possible. Hmm. So, so to summarize and, and, and to finish, I, I would say that, that if I should summarize the, the message in, in both of your books, it would be something like the direction of history is determined by our worldview. Mm. So we would better be aware of our worldview and realize that our worldview is a human construct and that we should take responsibility for our own worldview, but also that our worldview is a collective phenomenon. We cannot function in a society with, with individuals having completely different worldviews. So, we, so it's also a collective project of creating this new worldview. And in order to do that, we, we need some sort of collective sense-making process. And I guess yeah. your book is an invitation for us all to take part in that sense-making process and co-creating a new worldview. Yes. Yeah, I, I, everything you say, I think, is a lovely way of summarizing. And thank you for, for that, Thomas. And the one thing I'd add on, um, in addition to everything you said, is that a, a lot of what I show in uh, our modern world view is that it's not just that it's a created construction, but it's a faulty construction. Yeah. It's, it gives a foundational um, elements that modern science has shown to be wrong. This idea yeah. that nature is a machine or this idea that humans are naturally selfish um, or that life itself is driven by selfish genes competing. These are yeah. things that many of us take for granted as part of our mainstream worldview and modern science shows they're absolutely wrong. So it's not just that um, there's different, from a sort of some, from a postmodernist perspective, people might say, well, everything's constructed. You'll, you know, you take your fiction, either this or that. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Just recognize that whatever it is, is, is a made up uh, thing or whatever. This is different. What I'm showing is that actually modern science is allowing us to make sense of the world in a way that is both more scientifically valid and also allows us to then um, absorb some of the great tr uh, traditional wisdom that has been sort of rejected as being anti-scientific from our modern worldview. And that's this kind of integrated worldview of connectedness that I'm offering. So everything you said, but just adding that layer on top, I think is important. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It was w wonderful talking to you. Thank you for spending this time uh together. I really enjoyed it, Thomas. It's just always so great to, to share ideas with you, and thank you. 
Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye.